Great, we are now recording and I want to welcome everybody. It's great to have you here. Whether you're joining via our live session right now or you're connecting via the recording, it's uh, welcome. We're, we're happy you're here. This is a sep episode two of our web show, Awakening Beyond Thought, an online interactive journey out of the blah, blah, blah of everyday life and into the simple strength of stillness. I love that title. Um, it's hosted by Gary Weber and Rich Doyle, and we're, we're super thrilled that they're both here again. We're going to try to do these as regularly as we can. Really, the intention is once a month at the first uh, Sunday of every month. So that's what we're intending to do, and here we are in December. Uh, so Rich, Rich Doyle, a.k.a. Mobius, is a liberal arts research professor at Penn State University, where he has taught since 1994. Since reading the work of futurist Al... Alvin Toffler, at age 12, Doyle has been on a scholarly and personal quest to understand the effects of information technologies on the evolution of human culture. He's written many books on the effect of technologies on human evolution and the effects of language on consciousness. His latest, Darwin's Pharmacy, Sex, Plants, and the Evolution of the Noosphere, focuses on the coevolution of humans with psychedelic plants such as psilocybin, cannabis, and ayahuasca. So we're thrilled that, that Rich is here. He's worked with us before as well on uh, exploring the soul of nature and Radio Free Vallis, uh, of whom there are uh, probably, of which there are probably uh, many attendees here that will be connecting to check this out. Uh, Gary, Gary Weber, our other co-host, has done over 30,000 hours of meditation and yoga with various teachers in various disciplines and countries. He has a PhD in physical sciences and has worked in military, national labs, industry, and academia in R&D and management. He's the author of several books, uh, Happiness Beyond Thought, A Practical Guide to Awakening, and Dancing Beyond Thought, Bhagavad Gita Verses and Dialogues for Awakening. Uh, he's been passed by two Zen masters. We're thrilled to have him here as he you know, continues his work in a, many institutions to bring it here online is, is an amazing chance for many to connect with what, what you're doing, Gary. And, so without further ado, I just want to turn it over to both of you and just kind of flow. We have an hour and a half here, and when we'll, we'll see where we go. Beautiful. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you. Thank you to everybody for tuning in or listening. Um, it's a really magical day here. So uh, one of the aspects of the sunlight here, we had a deluge yesterday. So the, the difference between the kind of radiant sun and the... Uh, Seattle-like weather yesterday reminds me, anyway, of our topic that we introduced to uh, um, as a teaser to bring people into the webinar, which is this idea of aspiration, or uh, what I like to call vim, you know, just sort of the sheer energy and desire for awakening. So where we're going to start off is by uh, talking about the importance of learning how to feel that vim, to feel that power uh, of awakening, that pure desire of awakening. Uh, Gary, do you have any uh, tactics for finding Vim? No, one thing about Vim and how big Vim has to be, uh, we've talked before about you know, how much you have to want this. If you really do want it uh, enormously, you will get it. You just will persevere until you're successful. And the metaphor has been used, my Maharshi's metaphor was to be like someone with your head held underwater. Or at the local Zendo, uh, there was a painting, I think there's still a painting there, that says, has somebody with their hair on fire. So the Vim has to be, if you can get it there, at some level like those, where your hair is on fire, you're like being held underwater, because you'll run into fears along the way, and the fears will block you. And unless you have a lot of Vim, you will not be able to push forward and overwhelm go through those fears. So it's really important to understand that you do need to want this. It is not a casual thing that you just think, well, I need to do this or I can watch football or something. It becomes almost an obsession with you to be successful. Yeah, it's it's really interesting because on the one hand, we hear all the time that uh, we don't that there's no doer, right? That part of uh, awakening, part of experiencing the sensation, the cessation of thought is to realize that you have not been the author of your own uh, actions in the past, but there is a feeling. And this is why I like this word vim because it somehow captures the energy. There's a kind of energy pushing you along 
a wave of energy even saying, making you do this. And I think that I know that in my own uh, experience, there have been moments when I've been more aware of that uh, than others. There have been moments where I could feel the universe pushing me along towards something. And there were other moments when I think I felt in the dull doldrums, I didn't know what I was doing. I doubted what I was up, up to. What can we do in those moments when we don't feel that super strong uh, desire for awakening? How can we find our way back to that feeling of vim? Well, it, it comes back to, and this, this gets metaphysical, but it comes back to you know, grace comes and rescues you and pulls you back into vim. Uh, grace could possibly just leave you out there. You know, you could say, well, I tried this practice and I, I'm bored with it now and I just won't do it anymore. You could just be as easily just left out there to spend the rest of your days. It you, feels like that sometimes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> as you work with lo and behold, even though you're way out there, something happens, you know, dim happens or grace happens, and you get pulled back in. There you are, back in your practice. You don't know why you came back, but you find yourself back in it deeply interested, deeply committed to it, and you're on your way again. But if it does, it does get some level of feeling that you can't not do it, but you still may find yourself bored with it, frustrated, I've tried everything I can possibly think of to try, and it's not working. I just run out of options now, what do I do? So that frustration is very typical, and you'll get afraid many times. And so, you know, either grace will come along and uh, help you, or not. Well, there's also the response uh, that I have seen and can recall of like, okay, 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 I've changed my mind actually. Like, you know, I bit off more than I can vim. <laughs> you know, <laughs> like, uh, that, like, I know I said I wanted my thoughts to stop. I know I said that I wanted to discover my true nature, but this is just too weird right. and too bad. Can somebody just turn this off here? That's actually a good sign in, in, in my experience. It means that something is happening that is putting your ordinary self into disarray. Well, yeah, that, <laughs> that moves ahead. Often people run into that place where, oh, OMG, this, this is scarier than I thought. This isn't what I signed up for. And it's like, no, no. And they try to stop. And they find out that, in fact, they can't stop, that they are going to end up moving ahead anyway. But the ego has the ability to put up enormous defenses and it will haul out every trick in the book it can to put up resistance and put up stories and bring up old things you thought you'd forgotten long ago and put them in your face and say, well, well aren't you afraid of this? And many people turn away. But what's interesting is, is that that moment where you feel that you can't stop, mm -hmm. in a way, that is part of awakening. Oh, yeah, words, yeah. Because what you're feeling is this is not you doing this mm -hmm. and it's almost like the more that you can feel your way towards this place that this is not you, you doing this you feel that vim right? right you know so if if you're feeling doubtful or without desire for awakening you just you know just want to you just want to shut down in a kind of opiated bliss mm -hmm. right you just want to watch television for more than 24 hours a day right, right? you know you just, you, if you could sleep for 25 hours a day, right. you would. Um, in in those moments, right, that, that's actually a kind of flight. You're, th th that is actually a kind of uh, desperate turning away mm -hmm. from an energy that is obviously there. What What is one trying to sleep away from? Yeah. And so I think that the answer always is for Vim, to look back at who's not feeling mm -hmm. the vim. If you're not feeling this aspiration, I mean, if awareness like this exists, why wouldn't you want to? Right? You know, why would you rather, you know, rather just continue the kind of French fried existence, you know, that you have? So if you feel an indication that maybe it does. You know, that maybe the way the leaves are blowing on that bush right there by themselves, not being done by anything, indicates something powerful about the world, that there's an energy in the world that is not you. 
then you would absolutely want to be one with that. You would want to be part of that. You would not want to, you know, not notice that. So drilling down, getting into touch with uh, with Vim, I think, really is about looking back and seeing who doesn't have it. So something else I tell people, they say, well, you know, I, I just can't motivate myself. I, I want to just drop out. I said, okay, drop out. <laughs> drop out. Don't do anything. That's fine. You can quit. You can quit. Someone said, well, if I have no free will, why should I ever do anything to awaken? Because somebody has to do that. I'll just stay in bed. I said, okay, stay in bed. Just go ahead and do it. I'm all for it. You stay in it's bed. It's impossible. Just stay in bed for days, weeks, months if you want to. Go get me. Tell me how you do. An email comes along. Well, I lasted about you know 16 hours. I had to go to bed. And I found myself, just found myself walking downstairs and starting to do my practice again. So, you know, it's almost easier sometimes just to give in to the resistance you're feeling and just do it. And just see it. In fact, you can't stay in bed all day long. You can't not do your practice. You can say, I won't do it for a week. Fine. Those are for two weeks. Are two weeks. And they find themselves back in their practice again just by giving them permission to, to not do it. They try and find it. In fact, they're just back doing it. Well, especially if you adopt this, uh, this self-inquiry technique mm. of looking and seeing who doesn't have the VIM, one technique we've talked about before that I really like a lot and is the way I begin every day now, all my, more or less, which is, uh, I think that uh, it was Robert Adams that uh, talked about this, but probably it comes from a lot of different places where as soon as you're waking up in the morning to remind yourself the night before, as soon as you're waking up in the morning to look back and see who is dreaming. And, and the analogy I always use is it's like a, like a garage door that's closing, you know, and you can just sneak under and see, actually, you can see who was dreaming. And there's this incredible dose of vim mm -hmm. that you get at the beginning of the day if you look back and you see the dreamer. Mm -hmm. And if you start doing that, it's completely out of your control. I don't decide in the morning to do that. Right. Just as I don't decide during the day to exclaim my love of the cosmos, right? It's a practice that got started, and then it takes on its own life. Well, I think the light that's taken on is the brain sees that clear window in the morning. The evening can also, as you know, it's harder in the evening because most people are so sleep deprived. They just sleep right. They just crash right through it. But in the morning, it's easier to catch it. But you have to remind yourself the night before. I think the brain sees that. It says, this is cool. This is really cool. And so we talk about being out of control. I always liked your, your one metaphor. You said, well, one thing about certain other psychedelics is I take them and they may last six or eight hours, but then I know I'm done with them. I'm out of there. I'm back to where I was. But the danger with this stuff is you may not be able to come back. But you do reach a point, just a fair warning to the, to the viewers, that you will reach a point to where the eye gets so small and so dispersed so dissolute that it can't mount any kind of a defense. And you do find the brain has taken over and is now driving the bus and is soon to kick the eye to the curb. I mean, it's driving the bus and, and you say, I'm going to go back now. I've had enough of this. And nobody answered. Nobody responds. <laughs> nobody in there to do anything. It says, you, you and who else? There's just nobody there. And so you find yourself recognizing in fact the brain is now moving forward it has what it wants it knows how to get there you give it enough data and you won't be able to stop it you will not be able to come back well that's another version of uh the, the cessation of practice uh, idea as well you can say okay as soon as somebody shows up to not practice mm -hmm. <laughs> then they can do that so they can do it <laughs> as soon as you're actually a self who doesn't practice fine go ahead right. And then that'll force you to look back and find this space. Mm -hmm. um, now, Jennifer, are there any questions about the uh, VIM section so far? Um, well, I think actually Ivan uh, was mentioning as a question, but he hasn't sent it to me just yet. So, uh, no, not yet. But I think they're coming. All right, well, we can we can transition because there's a transition between VIM and physical pain uh, that okay. we wanted to talk about. Cool. Um, so if anybody yeah. wants to throw one in, they should do it now, right? About them. Or, yeah, or, or or throw it in, and uh, we can pick it up, you know, in about five minutes or so. Okay. Uh, 
when Perfect. we transition through uh, uh, this idea of self-inquiry and chronic pain. Great. So send um, away, folks. And I'll, I'll, okay. So, uh, you know, one of the reasons why sometimes maybe you don't have so much desire for awakening is because even though it becomes increasingly clear on this path that, you know, we're not our bodies, right? We're not uh, we're, we're observing our embodiment. We are not our embodiment. That when our body makes certain demands on us because we're in chronic pain or we're not getting enough sleep or we're just kind of systemically dysfunctional uh, in our diet or not getting enough exercise or we just don't feel good, then it's very hard to focus your attention on anything else besides the kind of desperate wheel spinning attempt to do something about that pain or about that chronic fatigue and so on. Um, the good news is, is that if you can remember, if you can hear the words of self inquiry when you're experiencing that pain and if more, if most importantly, perhaps if you can practice a bit before some of this chronic pain comes into your life, it's a remarkable way of dealing with physical ailments and so forth. It's not that pain disappears or that chronic conditions disappear right away, but by becoming the observers of those conditions, by asking ourselves, who's having this whole body atopic dermatitis? Who feels like they want to tear themselves to pieces? Who feels like they're becoming a reptile? Who feels like their head is going to explode? Um, it gives you just an angstrom of space on that pain, on, on that distress. And that angstrom is enormous freedom. You found this was people that you've worked with, haven't you? That it, yeah, you know, so I think we used to make a distinction between pain and suffering. Uh, pain is, you know, neural responses to stimuli or malfunctions. Suffering is what we can really work with ourselves. And Rich touched on it with the self-inquiry. If you can get into who it is that's feeling this pain or who it is that's experiencing all of this and not making a big story out of it. With pain, right? And of course, in one sense it was, you know, that your immune system is malfunctioning, for example. Um, but, there, but the message, the sum total of the message were the symptoms. My mind didn't need to go to work and say, this means you're like this. This means it's going to be like that and so on, which I was spending an enormous amount of time in my internal monologue wondering over my own pain, which was transforming it into suffering, as opposed to just being with the pain and being with, you know, the distress. Then I find what I've learned, what I in part learned from ayahuasca was how to observe that pain, how to observe that distress, and then make adjustments, as opposed to treating it to as a message from the universe about who and what I was and how screwed I was, basically, and how much I was doomed to suffer. There may seem to be a very small distinction between those two states, one where you're observing the pain and then basically experimenting your way out of it, making tiny adjustments to get out of that regime and uh, um, identifying with the pain, which turns it into suffering and narrate. Then you get also the mental anguish as well as the physical anguish. Um, so even though self-inquiry can seem like a kind of, uh, I don't know, I find uh, when people respond, they, they think it sounds too simple and sort of silly and almost a Jedi mind trick. Um, it's actually extraordinarily powerful in dealing with uh, embodiment. So we wanted to make sure that we shared that uh, today. Something else that could be helpful, this is all many blog posts, but uh, as you get, if you do go into stories about you know, the universe is punishing me for something I did 20 years ago, and this is what I'm going to go through now because you know it's my lot. Uh, you can go to those stories and you can either take the Sedona method which is online, or Byron Katie's The Work, which is many, many places online, lots of YouTube videos, where you just try to get that storyline into one sentence. 
take that one sentence and say, is this true? <clears throat> Am I going to be you know, damned for the rest of my life with this malady or not? And you say, is it really true? How do I feel when I have it? How would I feel if I didn't have it? Is it just as likely to be the opposite situation? And then you say, the Sedona method, can I let go of this? Can I let go of the story? Maybe the pain will still be there, but at least you can let go of the story. And you can let go of the story. And will you let go of it? Does it serve you to have this story? Does it help you in any way? And then finally, you know, is there some day in the future when you might let go of this story? Whether or not the pain goes away, could you let go of the story? And you really can't chop down the whole post-processing, post-analysis uh, narrative that causes all kinds of anguish unnecessarily. The pain's bad enough. The rich boy has a lot of chronic pain, but moving into that other side of it is what you can really avoid. And the question for you is, yeah. you mentioned the, the perspective you got from ayahuasca, being able to look at it. Is there anything you've seen in meditation that can do anything like that? Is it really uh, require surgery psychedelics to be able to drop back and have that viewpoint? No, I, I, I think that um, it was ayahuasca. I, I had already been a, a meditator when I um, was lucky enough to participate in some ayahuasca ceremonies. Um, and I, I meditated and entering into the ceremonies, but I think it was really my meditation practice that taught me how to a deal with ayahuasca ceremonies and B it was in ayahuasca ceremonies that I got some very intensive teachings about meditation, essentially about how to adopt a perspective that views the contents of my own mind and my own embodiment as an observer. Uh, one of the reasons I think that that really kind of supercharged my meditation practice is because uh, it got me to a place where I was perhaps able to do that in a way that I wasn't early on in my meditation practice. And then that gave me a kind of place to reflect on. Mm -hmm. And so it, it intensified the fact that, look, this really works, that being able to perceive and observe the, the contents of your own mind is actually a very powerful technique for navigating the existence of apparent demons. Mm -hmm. right? And so if I can navigate the existence of apparent demons in an ayahuasca experience, I can use that very same tactic in meditation and self-inquiry themselves in order to reflect on apparent demons, which is what thoughts are, right? Es essentially, my experience of ayahuasca is that I was being shown my own thoughts, and I was being shown the way in which I was um, essentially enslaved to my own thoughts, and that if I did not learn how to um, let go of my own thoughts, that they were going to keep coming back, until I was able to really uh, release them. And so uh, part of releasing them was to realize that I wasn't them. And I think that's the, that's to loop it back to the pain. I think pain is so compelling, suffering, of course, even more so, that we understandably make this mistake that we think that that's what we are. Mm -hmm. And we identify with it. We say, so I am this kind of patient, right? I'm a psychiatric patient or I have severe asthma, or I have whole body atopic dermatitis, or I have diabetes, or I have this. It's like, no, these things are present. It may sound like a subtle distinction or an English professor's parsing of distinctions, but if we traffic with this idea that like, okay, inflammation is present, I'm going to observe that. It gives us just that much sense of distance on it. And I, and, and so I do think that um, while, you know, people have heard me many times say that ayahuasca was a very important part of my spiritual path. Uh, I would also say that one of the main things I was taught by ayahuasca is what's contained in the self-inquiry tradition. Now, of course, people learn many other things from ayahuasca ceremonies, but that's uh, one of the things that was most salient for me. Well, something else, too, what you touched on there is this belief that, that we are our bodies. In fact, there is pain in the body, and the old you know, trick of 
if I can objectify something, I must not be it. If I can be the subject here of watching my atopic dermatitis, then I must not be the atopic dermatitis. I am something that sees it as an object. And so therefore, it is not me if I can detach myself away and see that really parsing out. And then there's a great uh, invited trick as well, which is, you know, I am not this body as an as a affirmation. And you just keep playing with that. It was a very important practice for me is to recognize that I was not this body. And uh, my Zen teacher, I try to take her through it, this I'm not this body. You just need to really understand and eat that at a level that no matter how awful this pain is, I am not that. I can really see I am a subject seeing that as an object, an experiencer of that. So I must not do that. And I think, as you said earlier, making yourself into pain, believing I am pain, uh, is different from saying the body has pain. The knee has pain, the shoulder has pain, the skin has pain, but there's something here that is untouched. There's something that is unchanging, that is untouched by no matter how bad the situation gets. Untouched by that. And that's what you really are, that untouched part. Right, you're that observer. I mean, that's all we ever are. Right. And that's what's so ironic that we've ever been convinced that we are that body or we are that pain is that we more we go along on this path, we realize like, oh, here I am again, right? The Buckaroo Banze moment. Wherever you go, there you are. Right. And and by that you mean it's like, oh, I'm always only ever in my awareness. I I never really even experienced my body, truthfully. Right. I, I observe my body. I'm aware of my body. But so tightly bound is our experience to that experience of uh, childhood development, probably, that we identify with it. As, and we overlook the fact that all of the time, we're always actually just in awareness. If you watch through your life as your bodies have changed, you can see that, in fact, there's something, there's an awareness there that has not changed since your first perception of awareness, whatever that was, very early in your passage in this, in this, this world, it hasn't changed. I mean, look, your life has gone on, you've all aged, you've had many, 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 many experiences, but there's still something there that has not been touched by any of this. Pain, travail, horrible things happening to your body, to your experiences, to your life, to your money, to your friends, still. Something is untouched. Here I am again. Here I am again. Dr. Yeah. Well, what's, uh, or White Snake for that matter. <laughs> but, uh, uh, well, one thing to, you know, the good news, bad news on that, and then we'll see if maybe you have some questions, Jennifer. The good news, bad news, and it's all good news actually, but the good news, bad news is precisely because there's something unchanged in us, we therefore carry with us the imprints of all these past experiences. When we make this mistake of thinking ourselves to be the content of our consciousness. So uh, I told Gary, I recently had an experience where I had been riding up my bicycle up a hill and uh, there was something malfunctioning with the bike. I didn't know that. And I, and I strained a, a back muscle. So I had to stretch out by putting my legs up against the wall and I was stretching out and all of a sudden, I had a memory probably released by this bodily experience from when I was about eight years old, which had been scripting my own relationship in my marriage for now 43 years, <laughs> precisely because I'm this eternal being who's just carrying along all these imprints for the ride, that until we release them and see that we're not that, then we're going to carry those kind of karmic imprints along with us. But the good news is, is that that eternal part of us just can't even be touched by any of that because all it has to do is observe it to see that it's not, that I'm not that. I'm not the eight-year-old boy who heard that argument. I'm that which connects the eight-year-old boy to this present moment. So questions, Jennifer? Yes, I do have some questions. Thanks. Um... And that was that was awesome <laughs> example there, uh, Rich. Thank you. Um, Re Regina Joseph asks um, to properly experience vim. Is there an element of having earned the right to feel vim as though using one's talents, as through using one's talents? So, earning earning vim. 
Well, I think Viv is, is all the way down there, always, right? I mean, for example, uh, I, I shared this with uh, a friend and student of mine here, and she sent me the etymology to the word Viv, and it turns out that it comes from the Sanskrit word Vaya. Uh, so, like, we're, even down there, we're kind of speaking Sanskrit. So I think it's always already down there, but that what we call our talents are probably the places – where our vim has found to manifest with the greatest alacrity, right? So we may be a mechanic or we may be uh, a writer or we may be a cook or we may be a caregiver. And probably our life has in some way taken a form so that that vim can manifest where we'll let it manifest. Do you feel like that, Gary? Or? Yeah, I'm just reflecting on my own vim. Um, I didn't choose my vim. I mean, I was Western Pennsylvania, whole country, Christian, fundamental Christian, and I had this this uh, knowing that, in fact, I had to get enlightened. It didn't mean anything to me. Certainly, within the, the Protestant church I was in, it was heretical at best. And nobody was going to get awakened. Somebody did a long time ago, and you're not him. Uh, so it was just something that was so heavily scripted against, but. Yet there was something there that knew it just had to do this. I don't know how I knew that, but I knew I had to do it or my life wouldn't be worth living. It was really what it was about. So I, I didn't create my BIM. I didn't earn my BIM, certainly by you know my stance against the church. I didn't get any church points for having BIM. So it wasn't something that I, that I, I, I earned. And people would come to me who really have lots of BIM, lots of drive to awakening, um, they don't know where they got it either. I mean, it wasn't like they went out and read some book and earned it, or it wasn't like they had done some special thing in, in grade school, and so they were deemed worthy, and so here is your bucket of them. Uh, it's, you know, it's one thing we can't make happen. Uh, you can't just suddenly can, can, you know, give somebody them. They kind of come in with, with either, maybe their them is trapped, Maybe they can't get it expressed. It's there, but they can't get it out. They can't fully express it in a clear way that can manifest it. But that's different from just, I don't care. Because if somebody comes to me and they say, I don't care, I'm going to do this or I can do something else. It's not likely they're better off doing something else, quite frankly, because they're not going to be have enough uh, drive to push through a lot of the problems they're going to have. And I've told people, you know, just do something else. This isn't for you. This is going to require more commitment than you have. It's going to require more drive than you have, more vim, more vim than you have. And so you don't have to do this stuff. You can do something else with your life. And don't beat yourself up because you're not doing this. Uh, it just isn't your nature to do this thing. But we, we live in a culture, though, that both stokes what we call desire and stigmatizes desire and seeks to have us satisfy desire. We can momentarily use kind of desire for awakening as a synonym for what we're calling them. I think as Gary was saying, I, I agree. We don't have to earn it. All we have to do is be with whatever is there in our desire. And so we live in a society where we have, Oh, I have a desire for something. I will fulfill that desire. So I will, buy a new bike or a new car or get a meal or get a new spouse or whatever. Um, or we say, I feel really bad that I want a new car or a new bike or a new <laughs> so we either satisfy it or we repress it instead of being with it. It seems to me is where it takes on a life of its own. It's like, you don't try to fulfill it. You just be with it and you'll see that your talents uh, whatever they are, are manifesting it. So um, I don't know if that uh, answers Regina's question. I, I hope so. Yes. Yeah. Something else I want to add is that sometimes you do have desire for awakening, but it gets occluded by the desires Bridge is talking about, where you believe if you just had a better partner or more money or a nicer house or whatever, whatever you would be happy. And it's, most people seem to have to can exhaust those possibilities. At least realize that there's nothing they can 
find in their pleasure bucket that's going to solve the problem. They may have to do some pleasures a lot to find out that's not the answer. And after you've had the good fortune of searching out lots of pleasures and finding it's not there, then that may you know, uncover your them or give you a lot more of them recognize, hey, none of these objects are going to satisfy me. I have to radically change my perspective. I have to really, I do have to find a way out of this mess. It's a mess, and I've got to find my way out of this thing. And that can be your BIM. You may have to experience a lot of disappointment before you recognize you have to find, you have to find another solution. Wonderful. Thank you. Both, uh, Regina, if you want to reply, just do so in the chat if there's anything you want to say back to that, those answers. Um, I do have some other questions here. Uh, one from Farid. Is there a point when the brain rejects the confines of the body as it takes this energy, but the pain and suffering is there to remind it that they are in it together? Um, thank you, Farid. Uh, I think what ha I think the way I would describe uh, my own experience, because that's all I can really do, is to say uh, less that the uh, mind rejects the confines of the body, uh, and that the body reminds me uh, or reminds something <laughs> that it's still here, then the body becomes an attribute of a much larger domain, right? In other words, that the body no longer feels localized in the same way. It no longer seems uh, uh, attached to this space and time in the same way. It's more like there is something that is observing and enjoying the unfolding of this embodiment and even borderline enjoying, um, you know, challenges to the body, right? You know, when you're not feeling quite yourself, it feels like a teaching. Um, but it's not so much that, like, the mind escapes from the kind of gravitational pull of the body, and then the body, as in uh, the um, Godfather movies, keeps dragging it back, right? I, I, I wouldn't put it that way unless I'm misinterpreting Farid's question. I think it's just more that the body appears to be just one of the other attributes of the world, a beautiful, unique attribute of the world that it is, but it's just um, one way that this eternal consciousness is exploring the world as itself. Um, and the more I identify with that eternal consciousness, the less I seem to get caught up with what particular things are happening to this body mind here. Does that? Yeah, but I mean, if you if you go down this path of I'm not this body, and you objectify everything you can find in your body as not being you, you the subject, you can get more and more separation back from that belief set. And I remember Ajashanti was giving us a talk on the retreat, and he said he was watching. He had a tremendous toothache or something. And he said he was watching and he was basically saying, I wonder how he's going to deal with this pain. <laughs> because it was excruciating, unbelievable pain. And he had the detachment, just sitting back and watching and saying, what's, what is, what's he going to do with this? This is really a mess. And just being so removed from the situation. In fact, the body would find its own solution or the universe would work it out somehow. He'd find a dentist, whatever. But this being so detached that it wasn't even you having this experience. It was this body having the experience and you were the consciousness that was able to perceive this without being touched by it. But, and, and ironically, that detachment, uh, which I alluded to earlier when I said that maybe it was ayahuasca teaching me how to observe my own pain, to observe what helped it, right, to help mitigate it, that detachment, strangely enough, allows us to be more present mm -hmm. for the body. Like it, it allows us to actually address what embodiment needs, as opposed to sort of freaking out and saying, oh, my God, it, it is death this time, or I wish it were death because this tooth feels like this, and so on. So 
I just want to make that clear because it can sound like, oh, detachment. I'm not going to care what happens to my tooth or my food or my foot or what have you. But and in a way that that's true because you're just observing it. But in observing it, what needs to be done manifests instead of getting all caught up in it and thrashing around. Yeah, it's the same line with we we talk about compassion a lot about this 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 distancing yourself away from you know, your body or your emotions and sensations, making non-responsive to others. In fact, I found exactly the opposite, which is the point that that as you aren't so caught up in well, what should my compassion look like or what should my love look like, uh, you're present. To allow whatever can really be done in the situation manifest the highest effectiveness level. You really can be fully present for whatever the body needs to heal itself or whatever you need to do to be compassionate with this person. There'll be a whole different level of compassion, a whole different level of being with your body in a way that can support its, its healing and not having an idea that you read something on the internet about how it should be healing or how I should be doing this or that to it. You're just present to allow it to heal itself. So the body has great wisdom. But you have to get out of the way and allow it to do some of the healing itself. I hope that helps. Thank you. Fareed uh, was replying back a little bit. He says thank you and uh, had said before exactly. I think I think you I think uh, he uh, heard his answer, so that's good. Um, thank you, Fareed. And I have a question from Ivan, um, and he asked, my, my question is, I feel like my motivation for awakening is being split between several approaches. There are a few ways I found to do inquiry besides Ramana's self-inquiry. This makes me doubt if what I'm doing is not effective or if there's a better way. I just end up going around in circles and don't actually get down to doing any method. I've been in this circle for longer than I want. Thanks. Yeah, well, I, I would... I would counsel you to uh, get a real feel for which one most appeals to you. Uh, and stick with that for some time, as I say in my book, Having a Feeling Thought. Uh, you know, the ego loves to push us into cafeteria or window shopping. Uh, it's a way to disrupt any future significant progress. It comes up with an endless array of different questions to ask. And you can find on the internet and you two or wherever, endless numbers of possible inquiry questions. I was uh, either too stubborn or whatever to not wander around a lot. I mean, I found that the ones like, who am I, which is the classical one, was more equivocal, more philosophical. And so I wanted to find something that was non-equivocal. And that's why I so said, where am I, or who hears, because they were clear perceptions that I should be able to almost clinically resolve or, absorb or see. Now, there was no way to run away from those. And I just resolved to spend two months doing nothing except picking one and then working with it. And after the end of two months, if it wasn't working, I would try something else. But I would counsel you to not change very often because it's a favorite tactic of the ego to, to, to make this thing not work out. Even if you think it's a good one, but maybe not a great one, stick with it for a month or so and see if it works. But don't let yourself be run around. You will have you will find you will have to change your questions. After some time, the ego will find a way to blunt this. It will find some way to stop this incursion into its territory. And so it will come up with a blocking tactic. And it'll need some other question or approach to come in from some other angle. But let that develop over some time frame. It isn't something that you change every day or you know, week even. Try to stay with it for a while, and we'll see stuff will start to happen. And we're trying to do a lot of reorganization of the brain, repatterning of neural networks, reconstruction of you know, internal real estate and repurposing of real estate. With the ego, I, working space, memory, talking memory, uh, has no idea what's going on. It's trying to run this process by having no idea what's actually going on in the process, or if it's working on it. It's all taking place offline. And so we're up here narrating, oh no, it's not happening, what's going on, it's not working out. In fact, it has no idea what it's working. I mean, it's all taking place offline. You have little tiny CPUs on top. 
this huge parallel processor and the needs just being repatterned. And some of the stuff may take a while to work out. So I, I, that's why I encourage people to stay with things a while because you don't have any idea what's being successful or not until you stick with it for at least a month or so. Gary, uh, is there a way, uh, a kind of telltale sign for you of when the question needs to be shifted? You said that like the ego comes in and kind of inoculates you against a certain form of the question. So where am I doesn't work anymore. Is it is it just a feeling tone of what occurs when that question is asked? Yeah, it's very much, this is a, it's a pretty surprising, this is not an intellectual process, you know this very well. It's really a tactile process. Uh, you need to develop a feel for what's working internally with you and not working internally with you. And it may be just entertaining some emotion and having the emotion go away, or an attachment and having the attachment go away. Just feel the difference between those things. So you get this kind of tactile feel for what it's like in your body, mind, as you get constricted, or as you let go, or something's working, or something's not working. You can feel that the attachment's changing or not. And that becomes your only real guide in this process, ultimately. You know better than anybody else does if you're really in tune whether these things are working for you. No matter what somebody tells you to do, you can tell internally if it's working or not. I went to my first Denver she and said, look, this question you gave me isn't working. It's just not working. I am not. I'm just, what else can we do? And we came up with something, and it really worked much, much better, and I could feel it was working much better. And I began modifying that, and I would go back and talk to you about it, or her about it, with her than with the person. But you could feel yourself that it was or, was, was or wasn't working. You didn't need to come back and have them tell you. You should be able to feel if it's happening or not happening for you. If it is, great, stay with it. If it doesn't, then change to something else. See, and then in Ivan's question, too, um, you know, there's a concern that some are better than others. And I think that the good news is that only he can tell what the real solution is for him. And so maybe part of the sort of window shopping is there there's a, that there's a kind of implicit idea that there is out there a correct method and that you just have to find it uh, and that it can be validated by somebody else as opposed to taking a method, working personally and empirically with it yourself Feeling, the, is it appealing to me? Is it working? Am, am I feeling some results? Giving it a month, like Gary is saying, and, and then moving on. Is that only you can really decide if it's a dish worth serving, as it were, right? You know, you're the chef of yourself. You can't rely on anybody else to tell you what the correct uh, kind of recipe is. Well, well you, you can DIY. I mean, you can come up, some people I've worked with for quite a while, come and say, hey, I found this new one. To work with. Yeah. Who cares? Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. They said, well, I got another one. I, you know, I'm worried about dying. I said, I said, well, he's, who dies? Who dies? <laughs> and then who dies is a very powerful practice. Or what dies? But it's something that's not in most of the books. The same thing with who cares? That's not in the books. People say, oh, I'm worried about this and that. Or even the really powerful one, who would you be without your stories? One woman sent me a bunch of things. Long, long, long email. I don't know why it's long email. Long email. Story, 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 story. She said, what should I do? I said, well, I got a question for you. What we're going to do is just have one question from me to you. Who would you be without your stories? And you work with that question, and you come back to me in a month, and I'll answer any question you have, any one question you have for me. So she went off to this lady and began working with this, who would I be without my stories? She came back a month later, she wrote it, she said, I don't really have any questions. Because that was the question. You know, who would you be without your stories? And if you really go into that and work with it, then the whole story maker, storyteller, story listener to goes away. But you just don't, those aren't listed in the books usually. Who would I be without my stories or who cares or who dies? So you may need to find one that works for you, but there are lots of opportunities for you to DIY and custom tailor this to your situation. Just don't make it very long. Make it very simple and precise, like, you know, who cares? Or who would it be without my stories? And you can work with it very effectively. One you've come up with, you'll have more buy-in to. It'll mean something to you. It's, it matters to you. 
And that's much more likely to be successful than the best one in some book someplace. It's not the best one for you. Um, we have we have a oh uh, first Ivan said thank you looks like I need to be firmer in the face of ego resistance and uh, just as a piggyback question for for this uh, Yas is asking how is working identified or recognized Gary you were mentioning about if you you'll know you'll feel out whether something is whether the practice is working Wait. can you unpack that maybe a little more. Yeah, you, you, you can, I mean, take an attachment, some attachment in your life, I don't know, like your cat or dog, and, and just feel how it feels towards that animal. You'll feel some, if you're it's a pet, you'll feel deeply attached to that. And then just begin to feel what that attachment feels like to your pet. It could be very strong. And you can say, well, could I let go of my attachment to this dog or cat? I love dogs. Not so much care. Dogs love them. Uh, what cats do? But let you let go of the attachment. See, okay, can I let go of my attachment to my pet? You try that and say, well, okay, I'm not going to throw the pet out. I just want to buy. But can I let go of my attachment to this pet? You can say, well, that's, I can't do that. But I'd, you know, I'd, I'd be okay letting go of my. You can feel that, and so use that as an example of. You know, tactically sensing what it feels like to have something that is heavy in consciousness, your attachment to your pet or your car or anything else, or your bicycle, and say, what if I didn't have that bicycle or car or pet? Uh, would I be okay? Would I perish or something would happen to me? And so you begin thinking about this, and the thing may stay in your life. But you get a chance to work with this attachment, not attachment. The same things happen to this, you know, big question. Who am I? Where am I? What am I? Who cares? Who are the story? You can feel if you've changed. Let the story things. Story, 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 stories. Who would it be without my stories? Well, you begin looking at that, pretty soon the energy of the stories isn't as high. The energy of the stories is going down somewhat. They aren't so persistent. They don't build on each other. They become more discreet. Story, 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 story. You can see that you're getting some activity there. Something is happening to improve the situation because you cut down the intensity of the network that's making this story thing go crazy. But just, and just watch that. Or who hears? You can watch the, the sound come in. And just listen to who hears. And you begin to watch. And pretty soon wise to make stories about, oh, there's, there's a motorcycle outside. Why are they doing so a lot of ways? So I wanted to get better monsters. Or and you keep listening. Who hears? Who hears? And find out, oh, I can hear the motorcycle without any story coming in. And a story comes in. But at least you can see that you've moved from endless stories about the sound to where you can really begin hearing the sound without the story. And then you see that goes on more and more. And eventually you recognize there doesn't need to be any story about the sound. There can just be the perceiving of the sound without a story maker. That can be the way you can unpack anything, to see if whatever you're working on, who cares? You care more or less going forward and see if it's happening for you. Yeah, I mean, this is this is how, you know, sports events work, too, right, is to bring the eye like I am a Steeler fan. Not really, but like, are they going to win? I have a map of them winning. I want the world to conform to the map of that winning. They've got to. Oh, like, you know, that feeling that you have. When, quote, unquote, your team is losing, or as some people put it, we are losing, right, which shows the attachment, um, that feeling you have or that feeling you have when they're winning, that is the feeling of the attachment. So being able to just observe that and saying, like, am I really this sports team? You know, am I really the outcome of this game? And being able to feel what it feels like to let go of just a little bit of that energy that is occurring, that's how you can tell if it's happening. And that's where you can tell what the attachment is. For me, it's an unmistakable feeling where there's an attachment. There's a kind of knot of anxiety that forms around the desire for the world to be a particular way that I have thought it should be, as opposed to the way that it, that it is. So while we might feel like we love our dog or our cat or our spouse or our children or, or our friends, a lot of the times what we're really doing 
is loving the attachment we have to a particular story we tell about ourselves and those animals or, or human beings. And what we're not doing is loving them because we're not actually being there for them. So the cat or dog is not going to go anywhere. It's just your attachment to the particular viewpoint on the cat or the dog is going to dissipate. Yeah, it's also important to recognize, and there's just on this with this, this partner, partner or spouse thing, is recognize, care, you watch really carefully with you and your kids or you and your pet or you're your partner. See if it's really codependency. I mean, what you're, what you're really in the relationship for is the validation they give you for being in a relationship with them. It's not about you're loving them. It's about this is an exchange. I mean, we're codependent here. And I need you to reinforce my images of myself. I agree with that, Gary. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but it, I, I was speaking of down in Philadelphia a couple ago. And this one woman who just went, you know, and just went, I was said that. She was amazed how much of her relationship with her kids, and she loves her kids, and her, her partner was codependency. I mean, it was just each one of them validating the other person through the perception of the success or non success of the relationship. It had nothing to do. With I love my partner, it had to do with I love my partner because he's validating or she's validating me, and I accept or don't accept what she's saying to me. So be very aware of your attachments and what they really are. Is it just codependency, or do you really care about them? Thank you. <clears throat> that was great uh, answer. Uh, really. Makes me think about a lot of things in my own life, so that's great. Uh, <laughs> um, Jazz, by the way, I totally pronounced the name wrong before, but it has another question. Do we? Do you want us to, to put another question, or do you want to speak sure. for a while? And, okay. Um, so, uh, desire leads to suffering, I hear. Can a deep <laughs> desire to awaken therefore also be problematic, i.e., add to the story of egoic suffering, especially if there is no indication after persistent practice that this desire to be awakened will or can be realized? Well, I, th I think this is why I was careful about what I, I, I said about desire, is that it's not so much desire that leads to suffering. Desire can lead to attachment, which creates suffering. Um, not trying to parse words here, but I, I, I think the best, the, my favorite part of the question, which is an excellent one, is the desire creates suffering, I hear, right? In other words, yes, that is the wrap on desire that our Christian culture has and some Buddhist culture has, that in general, desire is this kind of almost uncontainable force. And as a society, as a social form, in the evolution of social groups, we haven't known quite what to do with it. And I'm not speaking necessarily of sexual desire, but that's one of them. But desire itself, I, I think, is really just this you know, urge towards, and that itself is life itself, and that doesn't create suffering. What creates suffering is the attachment towards some point of view on life, some map of how life is going to unfold. Um, now, you could say the desire for awakening is such a map. Well, it is such a map if we have a rigid point of view of what awakening is. In other words, if it's an idea rather than a set of practices that we engage in and feel ourselves moving towards something else. Um, if we have a too particular point of view about what it means to be, quote, awakened, then, yes, we're likely to be very surprised, <laughs> you know, if, if, if we're lucky and, and frustrated uh, if we're not. Um, but, I, but I don't think that the desire for awakening is uh, like the desire for material uh, 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 success because the desire for material success can't deliver on the kind of desire that we have. You, you, you cannot experience um, the kind of happiness we want to have with material reality because it involves the mistake of identifying with that materiality. I am somebody that owns a Rolls Royce, say. I'm not, but let's just say that if I were. Oh, I don't really feel that good. I need another one. Or I need another one, right? This is almost maybe Osho's joke. If you know the guru who had how many Rolls Royces, his joke that no matter how many you have, 
it's not enough. But the desire for awakening is the desire for to be free of desire in a way. And, and when one is free of desire, there is a world of plenitude is uh, all I can put. So I, I don't think that we have to be skeptical about the de desire for awakening uh, so much as we have to um, see where it's leading us. Would be my response to that. Yeah, I'd also add that I have the good fortune to work with people who've been practicing for a long time. Uh, they've been, I'm not going to pick on mindfulness, but I'll pick on mindfulness. Uh, they've been doing mindfulness practice for a long time, sometimes decades. And they say, I'm nowhere. I've been doing this for 20 years. And I'm, I'm not moved at all, as near as I can ascertain. I've learned how to concentrate, focus. I can, you know, be present, blah, blah, blah. but I'm not awakened. I know I'm not. And I say, well, are you sure you're doing, are you sure you, you care, for example? Do you really want to awaken? Or are you just doing this because you've got a bunch of buddies around and you're all doing mindfulness practice, you have a nice social group and you can talk about it and you can debate this thing, you can do philosophical arguments. Is that what you're in this for? Because that's very different from what, for me, is awakening. I mean, if you really want to awaken, it's a whole different path than that. So you need to really look at your activities that you're doing in your practice and see what really stokes your fire. I mean, do you really get excited about, you know, going to meet everybody? That's fine. I'm not against that. But it's a different desire from awakening. And if you really want to awaken, it requires you to make a, you know, radical movement forward. And the movement from asana or mindfulness meditation, or so even the Soto Zen, over into direct inquiry is a dramatic change. I mean, you are going from being a passive observer to being an active participant in this thing. And you may choose not to do that, but it is a different approach completely. I've had great success with those people. If they come to me, they know what I'm about, and they've done the practice, they can focus their minds. They just don't know the next thing to do. And if that's what it is, then you can say, look, do the inquiry. The questions we talked about earlier, use those questions, put them into your day, put them on your smartphone, have a reminder app that comes up six times a day and asks you, where am I, or whatever. Uh, get into this thing. If you want to wake up, then you need to change what you're doing. Because what you're doing clearly ain't working. So try something else, or else reconcile yourself to you're just in this for a social Thank you for that advice, uh, guidance on this. Um, I have a question just about kind of, I feel like it's related uh, from Jess, and uh, I'm going to read this. Uh, to, what, to what extent, if at all, would you actively prioritize formal practice over family and work? I desire to practice lots, but I also want to honor my duties. You want to go with that one first? Yeah, I mean, I, I was, I mean, I did not have the luxury, uh, I'm not judging this, of being able to just practice. I mean, it's turned out the way the universe danced it for me. Uh, I had full-time jobs, 40, 50, 60 hour week jobs, lots of travel, wife and two kids. So I didn't have the option of, you know, going and spend 14 hours a day for, you know, two years in the Burmese jungle. I just didn't have an option. So I had to stick it into my day. And so I just did. I just said, okay, two hours a day, this is priority one. Nothing else matters. Job can fall apart, kids can leave, wife can leave. I'm gonna do these two hours a day and we'll see what happens. And I just did and have done for over 40 years now, two hours of practice a day. I just do it. That just tries for I just do it. And it's been um, my wife was not a supporter, of many of you know, she was very actively against this whole process. And it's very difficult for partners because, you know, they have no understanding of what's going on. They have no tools to deal with what's going on. They don't, they don't know what you're preoccupied with. So it's difficult for partners. You will have a lot of stress there. You still, I mean, I still honor my relationships with my kids, my responsibilities to them. I made sure they were provided for and cared for. But... I had a priority. And number one was I had to get those two hours of practice in every day. I just got up at four o'clock in the morning and just did it. No other questions. Everything else came in afterwards. 
And the good news is, is that that's how, in my experience, you live up to your obligations to your family, your children, and your job, in fact, um, which is that I don't think I could even remotely be present for my kids or my wife or for my students if I hadn't engaged in these practices, which have taken up, quote unquote, a lot of time. But it's been time well spent, even from this kind of uh, uh, instrumental uh, uh, point of view. I mean, I, I think you want to feel that desire to honor your family and your job and feel that and be with that. And that'll help you practice, right? That'll, like, who's worried that they're not going to be able to live up to the needs of their children? Who's worried they're not going to do well uh, with their job? Um, one of the beautiful things about self-inquiry is that you don't have to get up at four o'clock in the morning, right? I mean, I, I do think that there's everybody has some combination of different practices that uh, that works for them. But, you know, I, I probably started meditating uh, 17 years ago, but, you know, it wasn't always two hours a day. That was for sure. But once I learned about self, self-inquiry and was able to do that throughout the day, Indeed, sometimes it's, you know, an all day affair, then I'm able to do my work. I'm able to be with my family. I'm able to cook dinner. I'm able to put wood in the wood stove. I'm able to fix my bicycle all while doing self-inquiry. So I think that if you, you know, get still with yourself, honor your desire to honor your obligations to your kids and say, the way I'm going to honor my obligation to my family and my work and so forth is by prioritizing practice, then you will, as Gary did and as I did in a different way, find ways to prioritize practice. It is job one. If it's not job one, everything else will spiral out of control (laughs) in, in my experience. If you don't make this a priority, then samsara, chaos of the world, will have the final say. If you make this a priority, you will find ways of navigating and surfing through this turbulence in a way that is beneficial to your family, to your job, and so forth. And also, and we have a video on this about, uh, my experience was my wife and my kids were my two daughters, my best teachers. Because there is there is a no BS uh, aspect to having a partner and kids. Uh, the kids don't lie to you. I mean, they will tell you the truth, whether you want to hear it or not, oftentimes. And so, for me, they're great masters. And that brings to Rich's point about make that part of your practice, too. I mean, how you relate to them, honestly, openly, clearly, and see your reactions to them tells you a lot about where you really are. You might be someplace, you know, some special way outside, but with your kids, it gets really up close and personal. And I think use them as a great teacher. They are fantastic teachers, as is your partner. That, and I was going to say another point, which maybe is a good one. We've gotten much smarter about practice. Uh, I wouldn't uh, advocate people having to do what I did. Thank goodness we're finally getting smarter about with the neurochemistry and everything else about how to do practice a lot smarter. If you see the dialogues with Dominic, uh, we found ways to stick into his day, as Rich was talking. Drop in your where am I question, and put on a reminder app on your smartphone or whatever, and it just pops up and says, where am I? And you just stop, ask yourself, where am I? And that's a very powerful practice, much more powerful than just sitting by yourself in a room for hours and hours and hours. Because you get, we believe, much higher data value in contrast. It brings a contrast mechanism so it sees your day, and then you ask the question, where am I, for a minute, Two minutes, and you come back. The brain has seen a big difference between the silence after where am I and your day. And that has high data value, and that seems to make a hugely disproportionate amount of impact on what the brain does in repatterning. I mean, if you look at Dominic's thing on my blog, less than a thousand hours total practice. He was spending days without narrative thought in a very difficult, complicated, competitive environment, supervising some people, wife and a kid, living in a city, 
Uh, and he still did that in his, in his day and walking to the train and on the train to put it into his day. And he did not spend, you know, 20,000 hours. We have to get smarter about that because people aren't going to spend 20,000 hours. And I think we're getting down to where we know how to do that now to where it can be less than 1,000, 2,000 hours. Cool. Uh, that will fit people's schedules better. <laughs> <laughs> um, I have another question here. It's it's a little bit a slightly different uh, top. It's not different topic. It's all definitely part of the topic. But if there's anything else you wanted to say about this, or am I okay to ask it? It's. Um, Mm -hmm. I didn't know if you wanted to finish up anything on, on this. No, I think we can return to this different kinds of uh, yeah. questions after. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, so great. So uh, is there, this is from Grasshopper, and the uh, question is, is there really such a thing as individuality as uniqueness, as uniqueness if, if all is one? In other words, are we, in absolute essence, one consciousness? If so, all uniqueness must then be an ego thing, essentially. No, I don't. I don't agree with that. I mean, you can hardly find two people less similar than Rich and I. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> but we are dissimilar in many, many ways, and yet both of us can perceive that everything is one thing. I mean, the, the persona that you have, whether you like green tea or you like sushi or don't like sushi or have pets or, or a cat person or a dog person, that doesn't change. I mean, even as we are all one thing, we are very different manifestations. I mean, trees aren't the same as grass. I mean, Rich and I aren't the same. And yet you can see clearly that, in fact, we all are the same thing. All one thing energetically, all through us flows, Higgs field, wherever, some kind of universal consciousness field that we are all comprised by and penetrated with. That's constant. What isn't constant is the manifestation of that. And how boring would that be for the universe to have one manifestation? I mean, what kind of learning takes place if you should believe in a learning, evolving universe with having one kind of manifestation with all the same kind of properties? There's just no learning involved. There's no evolution. There's nothing happening there. So if this is an evolving learning environment for the universe and for everything in it, then it makes sense that we have very different manifestations and that we keep those personas, even as the inside becomes completely empty, still present. The outside pretty much goes on like it goes on, whether it be my Maharshi, or there's a guy, Maharaj, or pick anybody you want to pick. They pretty much were the same after as they were before, externally. That's no good judge of what's happening internally. And they stayed manifesting differently than the other people. But in turn, they had changed dramatically, and they recognized they were all part of the one. And indeed, I, I really think that um, a lot of this process is just becoming who you are. You know, a lot of this process is kind of realizing your uniqueness, not in some special way, but I'll give it, make an analogy. A good friend of mine who uh, I meditate with periodically, uh, he texted me a couple weeks ago and he said, I feel so alone. <laughs> and I said, great. Right. You know, now you know how God feels. Right? That, that uniqueness is the local feeling of oneness. Right. If there is only one one, which there is, uh, when we're feeling that uniqueness, our unique footprint and manifestation in the world, we are a way for the universe to figure out what it's like to be us. And as we feel that uniqueness, we're feeling what it's like to be just one. There's only one. So as we all realize that we really are these strangers in a strange land, and we get good with being a stranger in a strange land, then that uniqueness is not the same as individuality in the usual sense that we mean it, that I did this myself. It just means the extraordinarily unique local conditions under which the oneness is manifesting right here and now. That makes sense to you. Yeah, and stranger in a strange land gets less and less strange as you go along. I mean, as long as there's an I there feeling all alone, then that's some way. But, but as you find that the I gets deconstructed and gets you know, dissipated, scattered all around the place, you find that there's thousands of eyes, not one eye. If you do the Virginia Woolf exercise and recognize that in each relationship, you are a different I manifesting. 
you recognize there's just a whole collage of eyes, then the eye gets smaller and smaller. And if there's really a thousand of you running around, or ten thousand eyes of you running around, you got a million. Then you got a million. Even you've got lots of eyes. It just doesn't matter anymore because you're not one. You're not alone. Because they're all going away. And what's left behind ends up being just a very slightest, perhaps, concretion of consciousness into a very faint witnesser, or maybe no witnesser at all. And so there's nothing to be alone, because you are all. You find yourself as the one, and you, you as an I alone, disappears. Hope that helps, Hoppe. <laughs> yeah, please uh, reply back, uh, Grasshopper, if you have a. Uh anything else you'd like to add but uh, I think we're there, there are a couple of other questions they might be a little bit uh, deep I'm not sure you know we can also connect you because I, I just see we're at we're almost at the end point here and I wanted to give you guys some time if you wanted to uh, finish up with clothes well, I thought, I know I thought it might be useful to actually you know um, to maybe help guide people a little bit uh, into using these self-inquiry questions because you know, we could, like let's just say the where am I one, uh, which you could put on your smartphone with a reminder app. Um, but it's a little bit like uh, meditation itself. It's very simple, and yet sometimes people don't really know what to do. So I was wondering if you wanted to, because a lot of people say, well, where am I? I'm, you know, in the Walmart. <laughs> it's like, uh, so maybe we want to unpack a little uh, bit of how those questions work. That's a good point. I'm wondering, I'm wondering if it's frequently for you too. Um, well, it's not a mantra. You know, we don't just go, where am I, where am I, where am I, where am I, where am I? That's not it. We're trying to really ask the question and try to find out the answer with some curiosity and some interest. And then you ask, where am I? And you say, well, I'm sitting in the Walmart. I'm not sitting in my house. You say, well, okay, but where am I? Well, I'm in this room in the house. You say, well, okay, but where are you? Well, I think I'm inside this body somewhere. Well, where, where in the body are you? Well, well I'm, I'm kind, of, kind of in between the focal points of my eyes, my ears, and my nose. I'm kind of in here someplace. You say, okay, but where are you? Well, I can't find myself <laughs> in there. I, mean, I should be in there. I try to feel around for myself. But I, when I say, where am I now, I, I can't find anything. It's just quiet. And then the ego can say, oh, no, oh, you're, you're this and this. You're an emergent quality of evolutionary information systems. You, you forget who you really are. Here's what you are. Here's what you are. You say, well, no, where am I then? Oh, I have this degree, and I will do this job, and I have this history, and I have these storylines. Okay, but where are you? Well, I guess I'm not in those stories in any place. I'm not those degrees. I'm not the achievements. But where am I? You're the center. I'm a sinner. I'm a sinner. I, I come from a shaving bloody religion. So, uh, sinner is what then you are. I'm a sinner. I say, well, where is the sinner? Well, I, I can't find him. I know he was there before, but he's not there now. I don't know where he is. And so you have that kind of curiosity with the question. Just try to work with it, whether it's where am I, when am I, who hears. I mean, be creative with this thing and really ask the question. Really try to find out the answer. It's not an automatic thing. You just say, where am I, where am I, where am I, where am I, 10,000, 100,000, you know, a million times. Uh, there's one fellow kid of Ronald Hershey who had actually done the Shiva search of his own Shabaya probably 30 million times. There's a debate about what number, 30 million times. And he was no place, no place. So it's not a question of repeating the question over and over again. You've got to have some interest. And what Ramana Marshall told this guy was just find out where this Omnumashivaya comes from. That will go like that. So it's really changing your focus in a way that you really are curious about this stuff. We evolved this 75,000 years ago, relatively recently, at least, really. And you say, okay, is it really useful anymore? Where is it? When is it? Why is it? Right, and, and, and it's, it's not just this asking the question. You're really looking. It's a treasure hunt, right? I want to find it. And it seems like the most obvious thing in the world, but that's why it's clearly hidden in plain, plain sight, right? You know, it, that the more you look, the more you're investigating your internal realm. We're used to focusing our attention on the external world. It's like, where's the lawnmower? Oh, it's over there. Or 
Where's the car? Oh, it's over there. But when we turn our attention around, we turn our consciousness back on itself. We say, okay, where's this coming from? The call's coming from within the house, right? You know, all the Halloween. And you really start doing that. You get, it's an incredible energy there. Because you say, oh, what? because when Ramana asks him, where's Om Namah, Namah Shivaya coming from? This would be one, that what I was thinking, what Ivan was saying, I said, you know what? If you want to practice to cut through all these other practices, shut up and chant. Just chant. Do the chants in Gary's book or uh, find Nirvana Shada come online or do the Heart Sutra. And then when you've done it enough, ask yourself who's chanting. Look and see who is chanting. Who's doing that chant? And if you really look, and don't just ask, like you're going through the motions, but you really look, it's like that. It's instantaneous. This is, I think, what the Dogchen teachers are doing, the Mahamudra teachers are doing. They're teaching awareness to look back at its own source, and when you do that, you see that you can't possibly be who you thought you were. And so these questions we can do all day long. Who cares? Who's worried if the Steelers are winning? Right? Who am I? Like, and, and we can feel the difference of those. Like we, it, it sounds like they're all the same, but you can feel the difference. When am I is a great one. It's like, well, I'm right now. Okay. When is that? Weren't you also before? When, and, <laughs> uh, and so you look and look and look, and it sounds like the silliest thing in the world, I know. But if you actually chase it down, it's a transformation. I mean, it's probably, you know, uh, silly to do 20, 50, 100 push-ups a day. But if you do it, you get strong. If you do this exercise of looking at for the basis of your own identity, you get strong in a different way. And you get very strong. You don't have to understand it in advance. You just have to do it. Yeah. Cool. Uh just do it. Just do it. <laughs> Just do it. Who does it? <laughs> Didn't ask who. You know. um, <laughs> Just do it. Awesome. Um, I think we're right at the end point here. I have a very quick question uh, for sure. both of you. Just uh, if you could recommend the Vipas Vipsana 10 days retreat. Um, Erica's asking that, uh, the, the kind that they offer all around the world. Is that something that you would recommend for people starting out, or is that something? I, I missed, missed the word. Vipassana. Oh, Vipassana. Oh, sorry, Vipassana. Sorry. It's okay. Um, I, I've seen that, to be honest, that uh, for a lot of the people that I've worked with, that becomes a kind of um, avoidance, actually that I'm going to go on this retreat. I mean, I think it can also, you know, great, become be a great way to get grounded in a practice. Uh, but I've had uh, friends and students who've gone to such things and they've gotten some stillness and then they point to the retreat as the place where the stillness happens. And then they go on another retreat and they get really good at going on retreats. <laughs> And then they resent that they can't spend their whole life on retreat or they somehow try to figure out a way to go on retreat. And they become part of the hierarchy of administering retreats. Um, none of this is an argument against retreats. Um, but I would say that um, that desire to go on retreat, what I would do is find out how you can honor that desire right now in whatever you're doing in every moment of every day with your ordinary everyday life practice. Now, it may be in invigorating your everyday life practice, it pulls you towards doing a different kind of retreat. It pulled me almost against my will down to Peru. But that is something that will happen out of that bootstrapping of everyday life practice rather than the other way around. Like I think people want to go to retreats in order to invigorate their everyday practice. Invigorate your everyday practice. If a retreat comes, great, or so be it. But uh, I, I think that uh, most of the time, um, it's an unnecessary confinement 
of our practice into a specialized tradition and space and uh, can, in fact, detract from our everyday practice for that reason. I know that's very uh, unorthodox advice, but that's what I've observed. Why is this That's right, and people use it as an avoidance. Now, I don't know what to do, I'll just go and retreat. That doesn't I mean, better off what Rich said to do. Well, thank you for that. Thank you for uh, that clear answer and uh, Erica's thanking you in the chat and I think I think with that we're, we're kind of at the end point here unfortunately I know we could uh, other questions are still coming in and I want to encourage people to keep sending them to us uh, we have a we have a Facebook page on Syncast and you can also send them to us over email at info at syncast.net and then we can get them to Gary and Rich and we can work with these questions and and I, I don't want to you know, just have the end of this uh, session be the end of the questions. And our, as I mentioned, the intention is to do this every first Sunday of the month. So if you guys want to look at your calendars and, and check in again, whether you're connecting live right now or via the recording, we'd love to have you on live next time. And we do appreciate everyone here. And, and if there are any closing words, Gary and Rich, uh, final words. Otherwise, thank you so much to you both for your time. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for being here. It's wonderful. Uh, and thank you, everybody, for, for contributing your questions and your comments. And again, we'll be sending out a recording. I'll also be sending you an, uh, an e Yes, there's going to be a recording of this. And so it'll go to everybody who signed up. And you'll get that in a couple of days. And you'll also be getting an email shortly. And it's just asking if you can to contribute to us so that we can keep this going and help pay for the tech costs and and for, for putting this together, it would be very much appreciated if you are able to do it. So uh, appreciate that, and, and any little bit helps. So with that, I'm going to stop the recording, and we'll see you next time. You will be getting an email after this, you know, confirming that next date. But look to the first Sunday of each month, unless something comes up with our, our two presenters uh, here. We'll, we'll be happy to be here and, and see you all. So 